Jim Fox was amazed at how quickly things could change. That very morning, he felt quite miserable when he woke up. He'd been in a fitful sleep the night before, wondering how best to tell his daughter Emily that he'd seen her boyfriend with one of her so-called girlfriends at the mall. This in itself wouldn't be a problem, but these two were seriously making out outside the mall. Jim was pretty sure he knew his daughter well enough to know that she would be very upset by this information. It never occurred to Jim not to tell Emily exactly what he saw. He was just worried about how and when to tell her. Her volleyball team was scheduled to play in a district semifinal match in a few hours, and she needed a clear head to play her best. Jim decided to tell her the bad news on the way home after the match. Jim then thought back to his meeting with his boss that afternoon. He was called into an office and introduced to an elderly, ponderous man named Ralph Jenkins. Having no idea why he was in his boss's office, Jim shook his hand and kept his mouth shut, waiting to be addressed. Jim, we just finished negotiating the purchase of precision buffers in Daytona Beach, his boss announced. You just met the previous owner, Ralph. We're starting work at the beginning of the year, and I want you to lead our maintenance staff. I know you were unhappy with your chance to advance here, but we just promoted you. You'll be working with Ralph between Thanksgiving and the end of the year. He will introduce you to everyone and bring you up to date. You know our equipment like the back of your hand, so this will be a walk in the park for you. I have only one question. Are you ready to move to Daytona Beach? Included in the factory sale was a two-bedroom apartment owned by Ralph's company. You can move your family there immediately and live there for the next year without paying rent. By then, you should be able to tell if this is right for you or if you want to buy your own home in Dayton. Before you answer, I must say that this position will include a 25% salary increase. How long will it take to think things through? Agree, Jim answered immediately. My wife complained about the winters here in Pennsylvania. Her biggest fear was that I would be transferred to a plant in Michigan. When I mention the pay raise and Daytona Beach, she'll be thrilled. She can easily transfer her work to the nearest Home Depot. I will gladly take on this job. Then everything is decided. Why don't you take my company car and drive Ralph back to the airport and then take the rest of the day off? The boss suggested. Jim chuckled to himself as he dropped Ralph off and headed away from the airport terminal. Suddenly, everything started to look good. Emily could move to Daytona for her last semester of high school and forget about her loser boyfriend. In the end, everything went according to his plan. But then, no. Jim's wife, Helen, drove a red Camry like 10 million others, except that a child with a driver's license backed into the front of her car while she was parked at work last week. He bent the front grille quite badly. Most of the plastic had simply fallen off, but here and there some bent metal remained. The radiator was now visible in plain sight. As Jim drove by, he noticed a red Camry with a radiator parked in front of the Best Western Motel, a couple of blocks from the airport. With his heart pounding, Jim turned to the far end of the parking lot. There was an empty space next to the Camry, so he parked. He considered the situation. He wasn't a violent man, but if Helen didn't have a good enough explanation for why she parked her car at the motel, then she was in serious trouble. Gradually calming down, Jim realized that he was driving a company car, which his wife had never seen. The windows were tinted, perhaps a little more than was legal in the state. He decided to just wait until Helen came out to her car and see who was with her. After waiting a couple of minutes, he realized that just sitting around wasn't enough, so he came up with a simple plan. Helen's spare tire was still in the garage, where he had left it after repairing it a few days ago. He knew Helen would call him to bring the spare tire if she got a flat tire. With a furtive glance around, Jim slipped out of the car with his jackknife open and cut the valve stem on the spare tire mounted on the left rear of Helen's car. When he climbed into the back seat of the company car, the tire was already flat. Then he slouched in his seat and waited, none too patiently. Half an hour later, he heard a curse very close to his car window, which he lowered half an inch. Damn it, what should I do now? No problem, sexy lady. After a lunch like the one we just had, I'll be happy to help you, came the man's response as Jim's world collapsed around him. I don't have a spare tire. My husband didn't put the wheel back in the car after he fixed it. It's in the garage at home, 
Helen complained. What a worthless idiot, Helen's lover grinned. I always make sure that my wife's car is in good condition. I don't want her stuck somewhere with the kids. Now I regret that I didn't go myself, but went with you. What do we do? Let's go back to our room and warm up while I call, Helen suggested as the loving couple headed back to the motel. Jim waited for the phone to ring. He thought about how he would question Helen when she called, especially when she asked him to take the tire to the Don't Tell Hotel near the airport. The only problem with this plan was that his phone didn't ring. Twenty minutes later, a familiar Honda Civic pulled into the parking lot and parked on the other side. Jim thought he would never get worse, but he was wrong. His daughter, Emily, was delivering help to her deceiving mother. Emily knocked on the motel door and waited a full minute before the door opened. Jim couldn't make out what Emily said, but she turned and walked to her car and opened the trunk. She picked up the wheel and placed it on the sidewalk as Helen and her boyfriend approached. Frank, get this for Emily. She has to play tonight and can't be injured or tired before the match even starts, Helen worried. Thank you for your concern, Mom. If you were thinking about me, you could have already gotten dressed when I arrived. I need to rush to school and get ready for the match. Can you take it from here? Emily asked, clearly annoyed. No problem, Em, replied the guy who Jim now knew was Frank. As soon as I get in the car, your mom will drop me off at Home Depot, where my car is parked. I'll have time to watch you play tonight. I'll be rooting for you. Thank you, Frank. Just don't sit too close to mom. Dad will be there and I don't want any drama while I'm playing. Don't worry. I won't harm your father, Frank laughed. I doubt he'll ever figure out what's going on, and even if he did, he'd never question me. He knows it won't do him any good. Frank, I asked you not to talk about Jim like that. He is my husband and Emily's father. He's a good man and deserves some respect, Jim's loving wife responded. Emily looked at her mother. Respect? In what world would your actions be considered respect for him? I just want to finish school before I get divorced. I told you that I love your father and there will be no divorce. We will die in each other's arms, Helen insisted. I'm afraid you're a little delirious. Daddy won't tolerate you having boyfriends and sooner or later he'll catch you with one. Only one, and Frank is not the guy. We're just friends with benefits, Helen replied. We probably won't keep this up for very long, so we're enjoying it while we can. I deserve a little fun after all the time and effort I put into our marriage. Dad spent just as much time and perhaps more effort, Emily noted. He has a girlfriend? Your father? Hardly, Helen laughed. He's not one of those. You know how shy he is about women. It took him weeks to work up the courage to ask me out. He is a dad, a good husband, and father. Unlike that guy? Emily gestured to Frank, who was trying to lift Helen's car. Frank is a good guy. He is funny, attentive, a good father, and a very good provider. He's cheating on his wife. You just said that Dad is a good husband because he is faithful, and Frank, of course, is not. If he thought about his wife and children, would he entertain a married woman in a dirty motel? Emily was indignant. It was cruel and inappropriate, Helen snapped. I'm not in the mood to argue with you about this. You need to get to school and get ready. Frank and I will be there soon. We will root for you. For some reason, I don't feel so warm and fuzzy, Emily countered. Keep him away from Dad. Frank doesn't believe it, but Dad can kick his ass. Emily got into her Honda and drove off, leaving Helen and Frank alone while he tightened the nuts on the wheel. She's not too happy for us, is she? I think my daughter would feel the same way if she knew. That's why I don't do anything to warn her or my wife. I told you I didn't know she was there the day I brought you home. She should have been at school. She understands how it happens. She won't tell. It will destroy our marriage and she doesn't want that, Helen assured. Jim sat dazed in the back seat of the company car long after Helen had driven away. Finding out that Helen was cheating on him was very painful. Finding out that his daughter knew about it and accepting it completely crushed him. When he finally snapped out of his daze, Jim realized that his daughter's volleyball match was starting. Throughout her high school career, he never missed a single one. This must change. Jim returned to the parking lot, picked up his truck, and drove home. 
he had no appetite and even less desire to see his wife and daughter. Sitting at the kitchen table, he drank a few beers and tried to make a plan for his future. He had to appreciate the irony of feeling like he was on top of the world one minute, and then everything turned to crap the next. He thought that Helen might not even want to go to Dayton now that she had a lover. The more he thought about it, the more painful the whole situation became. He was always faithful and worked hard to provide for his family. He didn't deserve what Helen did to him. He always thought that she enjoyed their love. Then he thought that Helen had indeed been unusually amorous since Labor Day. She knew that if she kept him in a good bed, he would be happier than a pig and would never suspect anything. Unfortunately, it worked perfectly. Jim thought that Helen didn't know that his company was buying a plant in Florida. If he had told her that a company was transferring him, she would have assumed it was to Michigan. She would never think of moving there, especially on Thanksgiving. He could move into an apartment in Florida and have time to deal with his family problems without Helen talking about him. She could have sex with Frank every day. He and Emily will stay in Pennsylvania while he enjoys the sun and surf of Florida. The more he thought about it, the more he liked it. It wasn't much revenge, but it was a start. He had the weekend and the upcoming week to prepare for the move. He'll head to Dayton right after Thanksgiving. His loving wife and daughter would think he was going to Michigan, so they wouldn't even ask him to come with them. Jim felt a little better once he had a plan of action. To avoid seeing Helen and Emily anytime soon, he grabbed four Dramamines and washed them down with another beer. He knew from experience that it would take a bomb to wake him up before sunrise. He went to the master bedroom and gathered the clothes he would need the next morning and took them to the spare bedroom. He brought toiletries and a razor into the second bathroom. He then closed the door to the guest room and climbed into bed. He worried for about ten minutes before sleep overcame him. He's home, Emily noted, seeing her father's pickup truck parked in its place in the garage. I wonder why he didn't come to school to cheer for me. I hope he's not sick. Looks like he drank most of the six-pack, Helen noted, as she walked ahead of Emily into the kitchen and saw the empty beer cans on the table. This doesn't sound like Jim. I hope he's okay. I'll go check on him. Helen was surprised when she didn't find Jim in bed. She returned to the kitchen to talk to Emily. He's not in bed. He wasn't in the garage and he's not watching TV. Where do you think he is? There are only a few options, Emily answered. We can look in the basement and the laundry room, although I don't think Dad even knows where that is. Then my room and the guest bedroom. Finally, both women found Jim sleeping in the guest room. Their attempts to wake him were unsuccessful as he continued to breathe deeply while clutching his pillow. I think he's drunk, Emily suggested. I've never seen him drink too much before, but he really does act like it. I wonder why he missed my match and why he drinks. Let's ask him in the morning, Helen replied, closing the bedroom door. He may not be feeling well. Sometimes he sleeps here to avoid giving me the bug he has. He'll definitely feel like crap in the morning, so don't make him feel even worse about not showing up tonight. Frank thinks you play very well, Helen added. He thinks you can get a scholarship. Why is it so hard for you to understand that I don't care what Frank thinks? Emily asked irritably. As far as I'm concerned, he's a cheating asshole, and if I never see him again... It'll be too soon. You shouldn't think like that, Helen protested. Why can't you just be happy for me? I like him. He makes me feel young and desirable. It's probably because I can't stop worrying about Dad. I don't think it will be good for him when he finds out about Frank. It will break his heart. That's why he can't find out. I give him as much love as he wants, so he has nothing to lose. Frank just gets more than your dad can handle. Keep telling yourself that, Mom. I really doubt Dad would think of it that way. And if you continue in the same spirit, he will find out. But not from me, Emily said decisively. If you don't tell, he won't suspect anything. I know your father. He trusts me completely, Helen replied as Emily turned and walked into her bedroom. Jim's eyes opened around five in the morning, and he woke up. He quietly got dressed and left the house. He had just finished breakfast at IHOP when his cell phone rang. 
Jim, are you okay? Helen asked worriedly. You didn't come to Emily's match last night, slept in the guest room, and left home early on Saturday morning. This doesn't sound like you. I understand it. I just decided to become more unpredictable and act on the spur of the moment, Jim replied before hanging up and turning off his phone. Jim spent the entire morning at the plant, making sure his tools and everything else he owned were loaded into the pickup truck. He will need them in his new place. As time went on, Jim found himself better able to cope with his situation. He realized that he cannot change the past, but he can do everything possible to have a decent future. He will work in a new place, meet new people, and enjoy better weather. He was determined to make the situation work for him. Jim also realized that he needed to keep his move to Florida a secret for the next few days. Thursday was Thanksgiving Day. By then, he will be fully packed and ready to leave early in the morning. Helen and Emily will think he is heading to an even colder climate. He was determined not to say anything that would lead them to believe otherwise. It was already late afternoon when Jim entered his house. While he was washing his hands in the bathroom, Helen glared at him. Never hang up, Helen shouted. You missed Emily's big match, which they won, if that matters to you, to get drunk and pass out in the guest room. Then you sneak out early to avoid me and hang up when I call out of concern. I assume you're expecting me to cook dinner now? You might starve to death as far as I'm concerned. Two days ago, Jim would have felt guilty and would have apologized to Helen. Now he realized that her anger had no meaning to him. What does it matter to him whether she is happy or not? He simply nodded and walked out the door. Ten minutes later, he was ordering ribs at a local sports bar. Jim was surprised that he was actually able to enjoy life. He drank a few beers and talked football with other customers. It was almost 11 when he returned home. Helen and Emily were sitting in the living room watching an old film. So you decided to honor us with your presence? Helen asked sarcastically. Don't expect to sleep in my bed until you apologize to Emily and me for acting like a complete fool. Okay, was all Jim said walking through the living room and heading to the bedroom. He quickly gathered his clothes for tomorrow and took them to the guest room, where he immediately undressed and climbed into bed. He didn't seem too bothered that you were so upset, Emily noted when Jim was out of sight. He acts like he likes to sleep in the guest room. You don't know your father, Helen grinned. He won't last more than two nights before he climbs into bed with me again. He knows when he feels good. Probably, Emily answered doubtfully. I just hope he doesn't find out how good Frank is. Please stop mentioning his name, Helen insisted. I intend to keep this a secret, so I would be very grateful if you would stop mentioning him. I think you like to be the one who raises him if he's not ready for his wife, Emily countered. Helen stared at her daughter, hoping that she would be ashamed of talking to her own mother like that. When Emily first caught her with Frank, Helen thought it might make things easier. There would be one less person to lie to, and Emily was much more observant of her mother's activities than Jim. Emily agreed to keep Frank a secret, mainly because she didn't want her parents to get a divorce, but she became increasingly disrespectful. Helen found it difficult to be both a good mother and a good lover when her daughter knew she was playing both roles. Then there was the problem with Jim. What had gotten into him in the last two days, she could not remember the slightest disagreement, not the slightest disdain. He was just being bad and she wasn't going to stand for it. He will come to his senses. The sex she shared with him was too good for him to go without for very long. She was sure of it. Sunday morning, Jim got up early again. He ate breakfast at IHOP again and then went for a long walk in the park. It was a cold, peaceful November morning. He enjoyed the fresh breeze on his face, mainly because he knew he wouldn't have to experience the cold once he moved to Florida. He returned home shortly before noon with a six-pack of beer. He turned on the TV, opened a bottle of beer, and started watching all the pregame stuff while waiting for the Eagles game to start broadcasting. Helen decided to ignore him for the first hour, but then she stomped into the garage and drove away. Helen got home at 6.30 and the second batch finished a little after 7.00. Noticing that there was no sign of dinner, 
Jim turned off the TV and left the house. Twenty minutes later, he was back eating ribs and watching football at a local sports bar. The Eagles had defeated the Giants, and he found himself smiling most of the evening. They played Cowboys on Thanksgiving Day, and Jim couldn't wait for them to destroy the crying girls. Dad's been acting a little strange lately, don't you think? Emily asked as she and her mother sat in the living room. He usually watches the game on Sundays. Did you guys have a fight? We almost didn't talk, the mother answered. I told him he had to apologize for missing your match and drinking too much before he was allowed back in my bed. Before this, I told him that I would not cook anything for him until his attitude improved. Soon, he will miss my cooking and my love. He'll apologize soon. Emily and Helen were watching a film when Jim returned home. By halftime, the football match had become quite one-sided, so he left the bar. He walked past his wife and daughter into the spare bedroom. Closing the door, Jim pulled off his underwear and slid under the sheets. The next few days were tense for Helen. Jim remained silent, which suggested that he had no intention of apologizing. She had never seen him behave so defiantly towards her, and it made her uneasy. To top it all off, when she met Frank on Tuesday afternoon, she got another flat tire at the motel. She decided the two flat tires were no coincidence and would never use the motel again. Luckily, she took the time and effort to get the spare tire fixed on Monday, and Frank changed it for her again. Jim spent Monday packing the clothes he wanted to take with him. On Tuesday morning, he gathered all his personal belongings and tools and packed them into the truck. He moved the remaining clothes into the closet so it still looked full. I wonder if Helen will notice that he didn't bring cold weather clothes. On both Monday and Tuesday afternoons, Jim drove to Home Depot and waited for his wife to leave. On Monday, she left at her usual time and went to a nearby grocery store to do some shopping. He followed her until he was sure she was on her way home before he pulled into the parking lot of his now favorite bar for dinner and a Monday night football game. Dad won't come home today, Emily asked, sitting down at the table next to her mother. Who knows? He's not talking to me, and he's still sleeping in the guest room, Helen replied. I don't know what came over him. Is it possible that he found out what came over you? Emily asked. You told him he couldn't sleep with you, and you wouldn't cook for him, so why would he come home? Maybe you should just forgive him and cook him a nice dinner tomorrow night. I can't. I'm meeting Frank tomorrow. You'll have to eat leftovers. I'll be back home a little later. So much for giving Frank just what Dad can't handle, huh, Mom? You skip dinner and treat your dad like he's worthless and rush to please Frank? Somehow it seems that Frank has the upper hand in the deal. At least Frank isn't acting like an ass, Helen insisted. He treats me with respect, doesn't get drunk and doesn't hang up. Maybe because he regularly shares your bed, he's a good guy, Emily asked. Does he take out the trash for us, mow the lawn, paint the house, or pay the mortgage? Of course not. What do you mean? Helen asked. Frank doesn't have to do anything except get into bed with you, Emily replied. Dad does all this and much more. Frank has sex with you and you think he's a great guy for it. You don't expect him to help around the house. He doesn't have to accompany you to social events or sit in a hospital waiting room while your leg is set after falling down the stairs. You expect a lot from your dad, and you withhold what you should happily give him, giving it to Frank, and he has done nothing to deserve it except say how sexy you look. Your behavior is unacceptable, Helen snapped. I am your mother and I hope that you will show me at least some respect. And Dad expects you to treat him with respect and be faithful to him, but this definitely doesn't happen, Emily objected heatedly. Respect can be earned, not demanded. That evening, Emily stopped her father as he walked through the living room toward the stairs. Our district championship game is tomorrow at the state gym. We're playing at four. Do you think you can do it? I'll check my schedule and see what I can do. Jim replied evasively before continuing up the stairs. I think he's angry with me too, Emily complained. I haven't done anything to make him angry, but he doesn't seem at all interested in what I have to say. I'm telling you that he's in a strange mood, Helen reassured her. He's unhappy about something and he doesn't have the communication skills to tell us. He'll be at the game tomorrow. 
Look, his truck is in the garage, Emily sobbed the next evening. He could come to my match. He just didn't want to. Why is he angry with me? That's a very reasonable question, Helen agreed sadly, listening to her daughter cry. Let's find out what's happening right now. Once again, they found an empty six-pack on the kitchen counter, and Jim was nowhere to be seen. It's only eight o'clock now. He can't be in bed already, Helen said worriedly. Once again, they failed to awaken Jim from his deep sleep in the guest room. Defeated, both women returned to the living room. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day. Will you let Daddy eat with us? Well, of course. His parents will come, as will mine. This is his home. I will never try to hold him back. And he knows it. Hopefully he'll be on better behavior by then. I invited the group to come in around four. Who did you invite, Mom? Please tell me it's not Frank. Frank and his wife will arrive soon. I think he and Jim will get along great. They both love football and hunting. They have a lot in common, Helen reasoned. The problem is that one of the things they have in common is you, Emily noted. Husbands usually don't like to share this with their hunting buddies or football fans. You are showing classic signs of guilt and subconsciously want to get caught. This is a really bad idea. I just think they'll get along great. Jim needs more friends. Frank will do him good. You've really lost your mind. There is no world where those two in the same room could be any good, Emily insisted. We'll see, Helen replied. I think a surprise awaits you. Jim got up early on Thanksgiving morning. He drove to a small diner that was open until noon and had a quiet breakfast. He returned to the house at nine in the morning. His senses were assaulted by the smells of turkey, potatoes, gravy, pie, and a variety of other foods being cooked. We will sit down at the table at noon, said Helen. Our parents will be here shortly before that. Would you like something to drink? Jim shook his head, walked into the living room, sat down and turned on the TV. He knew Helen was trying to offer an olive branch, but he was no longer interested in what she had to say. He greeted her parents warmly when they arrived. They were kind people and always treated Jim well. A few minutes later, his parents arrived. I have an announcement to make, Jim announced as the family passed food around the table. I am being transferred to another plant of the company. I'm leaving tomorrow morning. The task will last at least until spring and maybe longer. Helen was stunned. Why didn't he mention this earlier? She could never leave so quickly. And if so, would she agree to move to Michigan? Perhaps that was why Jim had been acting so strangely for the past week. He knew Helen would never agree to quit her job to freeze her ass off. This is terribly unexpected, Helen's mother remarked. Helen never mentioned this. Will she come with you or will you wait to see how serious it is? I'll go alone, Jim answered. It would be unfair to ask Emily to change schools and Helen to quit her job. I'll just have to suffer alone for a few months. Both sets of grandparents began discussing the weather in Michigan and how cold it would be while Helen and Emily exchanged glances. Both were thinking the same thing. Jim is upset about leaving his family and heading out into the icy wasteland. No wonder he was in a bad mood. After dinner, Jim, his father, and Helen's father sat in front of the television to watch the second half of the Eagles game. The Cowboys had a 17-0 lead at the half, and things only got worse from there. All three were disgusted by the lack of effort from their favorite team. They were watching the pregame show of the second football game when the doorbell rang. Jim didn't pay much attention to her until Helen cleared her throat in the hallway. Hey, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to a couple of friends. This is Nancy and her husband, Frank. She then named each person in the room. Jim was the last one. When Frank approached him, Jim was already on his feet. Frank grinned like a Cheshire cat. He was wearing a Dallas cowboy sweater with Romo in big letters on the back. His smile grew even wider as he walked up to Jim and extended his hand. Hello, Jimmy. I've heard a lot about you. Jim masterfully kept everything to himself, but this was too much. Frank showed as much disrespect as he could, especially since he was at Jim's house. He laughed at Jim, at his favorite football team, but mostly at his inability to keep his wife. Jim suddenly reached his limit. Without any warning, 
Jim kicked Frank between the legs hard enough to knock him off his feet. As he leaned down to grab his throbbing groin, Jim's knee met Frank's face with a sickening sound. Frank fell to the floor in the classic fetal position, blood gushing from his broken nose. For several seconds, no one moved. Then Nancy screamed and fell next to her husband. Helen rushed to the bathroom and vomited into the toilet while Emily collected ice in a washcloth. She handed it to Nancy, who gently pressed it to Frank's face. Jim, like everyone else, was stunned by his actions. Not knowing what else to do and feeling the disapproval of the others, he grabbed his coat and walked out the door. Jim didn't stop for the night until he got off Highway 81 and drove for a while on Highway 77 in Virginia. He rented a room in Hillsville and fell asleep within minutes. When he woke up in the morning, he turned on the phone again. The mailbox was full, which didn't surprise him. He listened to several messages before deciding to delete them all. His mother, Helen, and Emily all called, demanding to know where he was and what he thought he was doing. Jim decided to stick to his schedule and drove the car south on Highway 77. As he drove, he kept replaying the events of the previous day in his head. That idiot Frank asked for it, but what will be the consequences? Will the highway patrol stop him and arrest him? Was he going to lose his job before he even got to Dayton? Would Helen divorce him now? He realized that he had to listen to his messages to understand the situation. He decided to leave the phone on, but not answer calls. He will check the messages after the caller gives up. Less than half an hour had passed when his cell phone rang. He checked the ID and saw that it was Helen. He waited a couple of minutes and checked his messages. Jim, please call me. I know the transfer has upset you greatly, but you need to pull yourself together. Frank will be fine, but he needs surgery on his nose. He won't press charges. Please call me. Jim rode all morning and all afternoon. He arrived at the apartment at five in the evening. As promised, there was a safe attached to the outside faucet. He was given the code by email a few days ago. He was able to open the box, remove the front door key, and enter. It was already well after seven when he unpacked his clothes and unloaded his personal belongings. He parked the truck in the garage, made his bed, and went to bed. Since it was Friday evening, he had two days off before going to work. During the move, he noticed a few minor problems with the apartment, so he decided Saturday would be a good time to get the apartment in better condition. Jim began to worry that Helen would call him at work and find out about the Dayton plant, and then decide that she should join him. This was the last thing he wanted, so he decided to call her on Saturday morning. Hello, Helen. It's Jim. I... Where the hell are you? We called you all night. Your phone was turned off. What is wrong with you? Frank has a broken nose and a minor concussion, all because he's rooting for another football team. Are you crazy? When it will be. Jim pressed the end button, turned off his phone, and began making a list of things he would need at the local store. An hour later, he returned to the apartment with a lock for the front door, an air conditioning filter, various cleaning supplies, and a 30-pack of beer. At noon, he called Emily on her cell phone, Hey, Dad, I'm glad you called. All hell broke loose here after you decorated Frank. The ambulance arrived and dragged his sorry ass to the hospital. Both sets of grandparents were worried that you were going crazy. Mom was afraid that they would sue us. I had to wipe the blood off the floor while Mom took Nancy to the hospital. I think she apologized to her a hundred times. Besides that, did anything interesting happen? Asked Jim. No. It was pretty quiet. Oh, there's one more thing, Emily added. Mom is furious that you hung up on me again. She was just warming up when you passed out. Yes, I could tell, Jim replied. That's why I called you this time. I got a new job and will report to work on Monday morning, in case someone asks where I am, for example, the police. Don't worry about it, Emily grinned. Frank is not pressing any charges, although I think his wife wanted him to. The cops won't look for you. So why such secrecy about your translation? So that's why you've been acting differently the last week or so. The day when I was informed about the transfer was very significant for me. I started thinking about where I was in my life and where I needed to be, 
One of the conclusions is that no one will respect me if I don't respect myself, Jim answered thoughtfully. I've lost my way a little over the years, but I'm getting back on track. Are you okay, Dad? Is everything okay with your health? Do you have any problems we should know about? Emily asked worriedly. Not really. You and your mother know about my problems. I'm sure of it, Jim answered sadly. Just tell your mother that I'm settled and don't worry about me, if that's at all possible. Okay, Dad. I will call you from time to time. Will you take my calls? Emily asked. Jim found it extremely difficult to contain his anger at his daughter. He loved her unconditionally, but her disrespect for him was hard to accept. He knew he didn't want to cut her out of his life completely. He had already mellowed a little from his initial anger the day he found out that his wife and daughter had teamed up to deceive him in the worst possible way. If you don't call while I'm working, I'll answer your calls, Jim answered after a moment of hesitation. What about mom? Can she call you? Emily insisted. Now will you answer her calls? If she wants to call me and tell me what an asshole I am, she should save herself the trouble, Jim immediately objected. If there is a problem with the house or family that I need to know about, she should call. Isn't that fair? That's how it should be, isn't it? I'll let her know. Good luck with your new job and stay warm. Is it really cold there now? Actually, it's better than I dared hope, Jim replied. I'll do just fine here, so don't worry about the weather. Goodbye, Em. As soon as Emily placed the phone in her lap, Helen began asking questions. What did he say? He apologized? Is he afraid to return home? What did he say about me? He doesn't seem to be afraid of anything. He said that no one would respect him if I didn't respect myself. That's why he put Frank down and why he keeps hanging up. If you ever want to talk to him, it looks like you'll have to be more respectful and considerate, Emily concluded. Respectfully, he was the one who beat up a guest in our house just because he was wearing the wrong T-shirt. He's the one who always hangs up. I'll tell him everything. I think the next time I talk to him, Helen promised. That's exactly what he was talking about. He won't listen to this. He'll just hang up. Frank is the only one who will get anything from you unless you find another boyfriend or two. Why do you persist in making such rude, derogatory remarks? Helen asked. Mostly because you are being rude, demeaning, and extremely disrespectful. Emily retorted. Frank grinned at Dad like crazy. I know it wasn't just the cowboys beating the eagles. He laughed at Dad because he had sex with his wife. This is enough to make any normal person go crazy. But Jim doesn't know anything about Frank and me, so he couldn't sense that Frank was trying to hint at it, Helen objected. Well, he knew for sure that Frank was acting like a complete moron, and he put him in his place. When you come to a person's house, you should not mock or disrespect him. Any man would be angry, even if he didn't know that his wife was this guy's mistress. I'm not going to listen to that kind of talk anymore, Helen screamed. You live under my roof and you will give me the respect I deserve, whether you think I deserve it or not. Jim was relaxing by the pool on Wednesday evening when his phone rang. He glanced at it and saw it was Helen and let it go to voicemail. A few minutes later, he checked the message. Jim... I know you're checking my calls. Please call me back. We need to decide something about the house. Who will shovel the driveway when it snows? Is it worth signing a contract for the supply of fuel oil? Which company do we use? Please call me. Jim listened carefully to the message. He didn't notice any anger, so he decided to call Helen back. She had several important questions. He didn't want him and Emily to have any safety or health problems. Thank you for calling, Jim, Helen replied calmly. I'm worried about the things you usually do in the house now that the snow season has arrived. Could you tell me what I need to do? I'll sit down, make a detailed list, and send it to you by email, Jim promised. I should have thought about it. You're coming home for Christmas, aren't you? Helen asked. Mom and Dad invited us to their place for Christmas dinner. Your parents want to see us on Christmas Eve. They always ask if I talk to you. It's quite awkward when I tell them no. They say you don't answer their calls either. I don't know what my schedule will be. I'll be home if I can. You can tell them that. 
You can also explain that I will start answering their calls when they start talking to me in a polite manner. Every message I receive, even from my own mother, is threatening and offensive. I don't need this, Jim insisted. Okay, I'll tell them, although I doubt it will do much good. They weren't too happy about the way you treated Frank or the way you disappeared afterwards, Helen answered cautiously. So there's no reason for me to come for Christmas, is there? I will not allow your parents or even my parents to treat me like public enemy number one. If they want me there because they enjoy my company, that's one thing. If they want me to show up so they can tell me how bad I am, I'm not interested, Jim said. You can still go home. Helen sobbed to Jim's surprise. Emily and I will be glad to see you and won't make stupid comments if we can help it. Don't you miss making love to me. Here it is. Jim had no desire to have sex with Helen. Hearing her and Frank together put an end to those feelings pretty well. He thought about how best to respond. He might have been making things up a bit since he hasn't slept with Helen since he found out about Frank. I always liked making love. Every time we made love, it was something special for me, Jim replied, although he forgot to mention that it was only because he didn't know that he was receiving Frank's sloppy seconds. Me too, Helen sobbed again. You are the best lover in the world, and I really miss you in my bed. Please come home for Christmas. Let's see if you can spend Christmas week with us. I have to take care of this. They usually don't give people that week off on the spur of the moment because so many people ask for it when they fit into their vacation schedule. I'll let you know, Jim promised. I will email a list of all the people you need to contact to prepare for the snow season. Helen hung up with a smile. Is he the best lover in the world? Emily repeated. It would be better for Frank not to hear this. He seems to think he's at the top of your list, his wife's list, and who knows who else's list. I asked you to show some restraint when talking about Frank. Your father is actually better than Frank, so it wasn't a lie. Frank is more entertaining, but not better. I'm sure Dad will cling to this little piece of good news when you explain it to him that way. He will be as proud as a peacock. His wife says he is better than her other lovers. This is the kind of recommendation a husband can boast of, Emily noted when her mother left the room in tears. Jim enjoyed his new life. He managed to spend time in the pool every day. Every day he became more and more tanned and relaxed. He easily understood the plant's equipment and was confident that he would be able to ensure smooth operation. The only thing that surprised him was the number of widows, divorcees, and unmarried women who inhabited his condominium. Everyone, without exception, seemed to enjoy his company. Once it became known that he could handle tools, he was constantly in demand. This didn't bother him because the ladies always baked something for him to take home, or gave him a home-cooked meal, or left a bottle of wine or a six-pack of beer at his door. It was a few days before Christmas and Helen was pressuring him to commit to going home for the holidays. Jim had just finished fixing Mrs. Strather's closet door when he turned around and saw her standing naked by the bed. I would like to repay you for your kindness, Jim. The middle-aged widow smiled. I don't have a lot of extra money, but I have a lot of pent-up desires and needs. Will you make love to me? Jim was torn. He never cheated on his wife. In fact, he only had sex with one woman in his life. Susan Struthers had large, perky breasts and gorgeous legs that went up. She was a very desirable woman, and not only for her age. Susan, I need to work out some things in my marriage. I'll have a better idea of where I'll be after Christmas. I have never cheated on my wife, but she may no longer be my wife. In any case, I will either ask you if the proposal is still valid after the holiday or I will make peace with my wife. I must admit that at the moment the chances of reconciliation are slim. I understand, the widow nodded, throwing her robe over her shoulders. That stupid bitch didn't appreciate what a gem she had and cheated on you, didn't she? I'll be here and the offer will remain valid after the holidays. You know I'm not the only lady here whose needs aren't being met, right? All the girls like you. You are always a gentleman always kind and helpful, and we all know we can trust you. If you decide that the marriage is over, you will find many ladies ready to console, Susan Struthers predicted.
Jim called Helen and said he would try to be home on Christmas Eve. He was surprised at how happy she seemed. He knew he missed Helen and Emily, and he owed it to them as well as to himself to resolve the matter one way or another. With this in mind, he set off north three days before Christmas. On the first day, he drove halfway. So on the second day, he had time to go shopping, and he would still get home in the evening before Christmas Eve. He was even willing to visit his parents for Christmas Eve dinner. If they were too unhappy, he would simply leave. It was nine o'clock when he pulled out onto his street and saw many cars parked in his driveway. Jim recognized several of them. It turned out that Helen was throwing her usual informal holiday party for her friends at Home Depot. As he approached the front door, he was able to look into the kitchen. There, big as life, was fucking asshole Frank, not wanting to have anything to do with him and spoil the holiday mood. Jim walked around the back of the house and opened the door leading to the basement. He could hang out there until the party was over and Frank left. He was dozing on an old sofa that he had stolen several years ago. He woke up almost two hours after he fell asleep. He listened, but did not hear the noise coming from above. He returned to the yard and looked around. There is only one strange machine left. Jim headed back to the front door, wondering who it belonged to. He looked into the kitchen again, but this time Helen was with Frank. He squeezed her left breast while kissing her. Jim immediately felt his old rage return. He stopped himself from rushing in and attacking Frank. He got away with it once, but he's unlikely to do it again. He decided to sneak upstairs and wait to catch the two lovers in the act. Then he'll take a few pictures with his phone and tell her to go to hell and head back to Florida. It seemed like a good plan, but it didn't work out. Jim easily entered the house and climbed the stairs unnoticed. He slipped into the guest room and waited, turning off the lights and opening the door slightly. About 20 minutes later, Helen walked up the stairs and entered the master bedroom. Jim heard the shower turn on and it freaked him out. The bitch was going to take a shower and clean herself up for her lover. Frank was still walking downstairs when it dawned on Jim. He walked out into the hallway and turned off the bedside lamp before returning to the guest room. When Frank was about a third up, Jim reached out and turned off the light in the hallway. He knew from experience that the second floor would be very dark, but in the dim light from the street, he could make out the silhouette of anyone coming up the stairs. Frank muttered something as the lights went out, but continued up the stairs. Jim walked out of the bedroom and stood at the top of the stairs watching Frank approach. When Frank had only three steps left to take, Jim kicked him with his right foot. He felt his heel touch Frank's jaw. The man flew back so quickly that Jim was startled. In the dim light, he could see Frank sliding down the stairs like a bobsledder in a straight line. He hit the bottom step of the stairs and, by inertia, ended up in the center of the living room. Once there, he remained completely motionless. Jim could hear the water running in the shower and knew that Helen had not heard the sounds the man made as he jumped upside down. Jim thought again as the rage he felt began to dissipate. If Frank dies, he'll be in deep shit. Jim quickly went down the stairs, stepped over Frank's prone body, and left the house. Two hours later, he was already a hundred miles away and decided to add many more miles before stopping. It was almost dawn when he finally pulled into a cheap motel and paid cash for his room. He slept for four hours and headed south again. Driving the car, he thought about the situation. He attacked a man. This could be a very serious situation depending on whether Frank survives or not. How did it come to this? Jim realized that he needed to stay away from Frank and Helen, or he would end up in prison for murder. They just weren't worth it. He also admitted to himself that he felt lonely and lost without Helen. Until recently, he and Emily had been the center of his universe. They betrayed him, and he needed to move on. At noon, his cell phone rang. It was his parents' number, so he went to voicemail. He didn't have the heart to explain to his mother why he wouldn't come to dinner on Christmas Eve or why he attacked Frank again. Half an hour later, he gathered his courage and listened to the message. Jim, this is your father. Call us when you receive it. All hell has broken loose in your house. Helen and Emily are fine, but things have happened that you need to know about. 
Hello, Father. I just received your message. What's happened? Jim asked when his father picked up the phone. There's no easy way to tell you this, son. That damn Frank was at your house again last night. It was already late. He fell down the stairs and was seriously hurt. He suffered a broken jaw, a broken arm, several broken ribs, and another concussion. His wife was furious when she found out that you had him. She got the impression that he was working late at Home Depot on year-end inventory. She got to your house before the paramedics loaded him into the ambulance. She probably slapped Helen and called her every name in the book. She even tried to throw her husband off the gurney but was stopped by the police. To say she was upset would be an understatement. This all takes us back to Thanksgiving when you threw that idiot out. We were upset about the apparent brutal attack on a guy simply because he was wearing a cowboy shirt. Now that we have a little clearer picture of what's going on, your mother and I want to apologize to you. We should have known you wouldn't do something like that without a good reason. We are proud of you, son. You showed more restraint than I did. Thank you, Dad. How's Emily? Was she at home all this time? Asked Jim. This is another problem. She and I had a pretty serious conversation this morning. Yesterday she spent the night with a friend, but today she admitted that she knew Helen was spreading her legs for this idiot. In her defense, Emily said she wanted the family to stay together until she finished school. After that, she was going to tell you. Needless to say, we were very disappointed and I can't imagine how you feel. Your mother told her that she betrayed you just like Helen. There were a lot of tears, but at the end, we all hugged. Thank you for your support and for helping Emily figure it out, Jim replied. Son, where are you really? I know you said you were transferred, but now that I know what the problems were, I wonder if you just moved to a motel or got a room here in town. No matter how angry you are, moving to Michigan in December is pretty drastic. The company bought a smaller house in Daytona Beach. I was promoted and transferred here. They gave me a big raise and a small apartment. I'm the maintenance supervisor, Jim boasted to his father. In Florida? Not a damn thing. This is cool. Would you mind if your mom and I visit you in February? By then we'll have had enough of winter. Anytime, Dad. You're welcome. Please don't tell Helen where I am. I don't want to explain anything to her now. I hear you, Jim. It is unlikely that we will talk to her about anything. I would advise you to talk to Emily. She's feeling pretty depressed about all this chaos. She thinks you must have known Helen was cheating because you were so cold to both of them. Did you know Emily knew about this? I need to go, Dad. We'll discuss all this later when the dust settles. Thanks for your understanding and help, Emily. I love you both, Jim said, ending the conversation. He returned to his apartment at dusk on Christmas Eve. It was Jim's first Christmas alone, and he felt depressed. He turned on the TV, opened beer, and sat on the couch to vegetate. He was still thinking when the doorbell rang. I saw that your light was on, and I came to wish you a Merry Christmas, greeted Susan Struthers. It's not good to be alone at Christmas for both of us. The fact that you came back tells me that you have not made peace with your wife. It's a reasonable assumption, Jim agreed. Her boyfriend was going to sleep in my bed. I hate crowds, unless, of course, it's a couple of women. What about one woman? I may make you move a little, but I don't think you'll mind, Susan added pointedly. Jim considered her offer for a moment before accepting. I would really like that. I must warn you that I haven't had sex for a long time, and I must not be very good at it. Otherwise, my wife wouldn't go looking for happiness on the side. I really doubt you were the problem. When a man is as gracious, selfless, and kind as you are in everyday life, you can bet he'll be great in the bedroom, Susan replied. Do you have condoms? No, I haven't used them in 20 years, Jim replied, realizing that he still had a lot to learn about dating. Your partners will appreciate that you have them. It's a healthy, mindful thing. This is true? asked Susan. So it was and Jim had a great Christmas Eve. His anger towards Helen and Emily began to fade as he replaced it with happy memories that improved his self-esteem. He still felt the pain, as well as the void their actions had created in his life. But he had finally gotten over it. People did bad things, even good people, 
and even people he loved. Susan helped make sure that life was truly worth living. She snuck out of his house while it was still dark on Christmas morning to avoid gossip at the condominium, but agreed to meet at the heated pool later on Christmas Day. That evening, Jim enjoyed a home-cooked meal and another round of lovemaking with Susan. He returned to his room at nine o'clock in the evening, again to avoid gossip. There was no doubt that several eyes had seen him enter and leave Susan's apartment. Jim's phone rang a few minutes after he got home. Dad, you didn't come home for Christmas, but I don't blame you. Mom is a mess, and I feel like crap too. I'm so sorry for what we did to you. I knew it was wrong, but I was selfish. I wanted you to stay together until I finished school. It's all water under the bridge, Jim answered. I won't lie. You both caused me a lot of pain. I had no idea that your mother was so unhappy with me. It never occurred to me that you would agree and even help her hide this from me. I'm trying to get through this, but it's not easy. This is the strangest thing. Mom is not unhappy with you. She told me that you are a good husband, father, and lover. She just wanted to try something different, and now she fucking regrets the idea. Did you know about Frank and Mom on Thanksgiving, when Mom invited him over? Yes. I should have apologized for losing control, but the damn guy rubbed his nose in my face. I just snapped at the level of disrespect he and your mother showed me. I understand everything clearly. I was glad you decorated it. I saw his stupid grin and realized that he was gloating. Mom insisted it was because of the cowboy shirt, but it had never bothered you before. Did you miss my last two matches because you were upset with me? Yes, I'm really sorry, but when Frank said he'd be cheering for you, I knew I couldn't go. Otherwise, I'd be in jail right now, Jim said. Did you hear, Frank? Were you there when I brought the spare tire? You cut the valve stem, didn't you? You wanted to know if your mom would call you for help to get her to confess. Instead, I found myself in the thick of things. I'm so sorry, Dad. I really was selfish and stupid, and now I'm paying for it. Don't blame yourself for this. I should have just met your mother on the spot, but I discovered that I have anger issues. I would probably send them both to the hospital. I doubt it, Dad, Emily answered. You're just not the type to hurt a woman, especially your wife. Frank is a completely different story. Grandpa told you that Frank fell down our stairs last night. He is pretty damaged, but is expected to make a full recovery, although it will take some time. Guess what I found in the basement? It was the new laptop you must have left me for Thanksgiving. This was planned ahead. Thank you very much. I'll use it a lot, especially when I go to college next year, Emily promised. I'm glad you liked it, Jim replied, realizing that he had forgotten about the gifts that he had put on the sofa in the basement. Did you also find one for your mother? She cried like a child when she saw the pearls. It was a nice gift, and it really made her feel even worse about the way she treated you. Funny thing is, I didn't see these gifts until a few days before Christmas when I was in the basement looking for new Christmas tree lights. Thank you for being such a good father for so many years. I'm just beginning to appreciate you, as I should, Emily admitted with a slight sob. Don't be upset. When I was your age, I thought my parents were dumber than a box of rocks. They really learned a lot over the next few years, Jim chuckled. I just want you to be happy and have a wonderful life. Do not worry about me. I'll be okay. I love you, Dad. Maybe I'll even find a way to get to Michigan to visit you this winter, Emily suggested. Um, I didn't tell the whole truth about my transfer. The company bought a small house in Daytona Beach. This is where I live now. If you want to visit me, I have a spare bedroom. There's a pool right outside my door, and the ocean is a couple blocks away. Are you kidding me? If my mother and I knew about this, we would go with you. Oh, I guess you didn't really want us, did you? We didn't deserve to be with you after all the pain we caused. I don't blame you for not telling us. We lied to you every day, so you had the right not to tell the whole truth at least once. This will really push Mom over the edge. You don't have to tell her anything, although it's no longer a secret. I'll email her my address so we can negotiate the divorce by mail and I won't have to go back there, Jim reasoned. I was afraid to ask about this. Are you going to divorce your mom? I understand everything and don't blame you at all. I warned her when she dated that clown, 
but she believed you'd never know. I just wish things had turned out differently. Good night, Dad. I'll probably try to come visit. Oh, cool. Good night and Merry Christmas. Emily had just put her phone back in her pocket when her mother came into the room. Did I understand correctly that your father is not actually in Michigan? Then where is he and why did he lie to us? He's at his company's newly acquired plant in Daytona Beach, Emily answered. He didn't lie to us. He said that he was being transferred to another plant, and so it was. We didn't know they had one in Dayton, so we assumed it was in Michigan. He didn't tell us because he was there when you called me to bring the spare tire to the motel. He heard the entire conversation and knew who you were in the cheap room with. He didn't feel obligated to take us into account. Why didn't he say anything then? Was he afraid of Frank? Helen asked. Afraid of Frank? What the hell is wrong with you? Emily asked. He wiped the floor with Frank's ass. Frank is no match for his father either in a fight or in raising a family. You are always trying to find flaws or weaknesses in him in order to justify the unforgivable. I would strongly advise you not to treat your next husband the same way you treat your father. Next husband? What did your father tell you? Asked the alarmed Helen. It's hard to believe, but he's had enough of your deception and lies. He feels that divorce is the next step. I told you he'll do it when he finds out. I don't want a divorce. I don't like Frank. I don't even like him. None of this would have happened if he hadn't fallen down the stairs. Helen whined. Didn't you listen? You were doomed the day I delivered your spare tear to the motel. Dad was there, saw and heard everything. He knows how much we disrespected him. He knows you lied, he knows you cheated, and he knew it when he hit Frank on Thanksgiving. By that time, you were already a divorced walking woman. Frank is not to blame for anything. He is yours. He made the porridge himself. Maybe now that his wife is divorcing him, you two can be together, Emily suggested. I don't need this donkey. I want Jim to come back, Helen sobbed. The next day was even worse for Helen. Emily called her father to explain the new problem. Mom received a letter from the state health department. Her boyfriend took a blood test while he was in the hospital, and he has a sexually transmitted disease. Mom must get tested and also tell them about everyone she has had sex with. You're on her list, although I'm not sure how far down you are. You will receive a letter very soon. Wow, I probably should have seen this coming. I'll make an appointment today. Thank you for letting me know right away. I appreciate the care and attention. This is the kind of treatment a man should expect from his daughter. I got lost for a while, but now I'm back on the right track. Take care of yourself, Dad. Jim arranged for an immediate examination. He had to give Susan credit for being smart enough to prevent the spread of any STD Helen might have passed on to him. On his way home from work, he bought a bunch of different types of condoms. When he got home, he took out a large bowl and almost filled it with condoms. He placed the bowl on the bedside table. He promised himself that he would never cause any sweet lady to contract a disgusting disease that was so easily preventable. As time went by, Jim received the results of his blood test and was pleased to learn that he was not sick. Jim's free time was filled with requests from the condominium women to do housework. He became more and more in demand. One evening when he mentioned this to Susan, she admitted that she had mentioned to two girls that he was very capable in bed. They were sworn to secrecy, but she admitted they may have let it slip in the company of women, most of whom were unmarried. For whatever reason the ladies liked him, Jim found himself regularly stopping by the drugstore to refill his condom bowl. Without exception, all the ladies who entered his bedroom rummaged through the basin, looking at the condoms before choosing one or two. They all seemed pleased that he was so concerned about his and their health. It just added to his legend. One afternoon, shortly before Easter, Jim opened the door and saw Emily with a small suitcase. Before he could speak, she threw herself into his arms and hugged him tightly. I'm so sorry, Dad. Please forgive me and let me stay with you for a few days. But I will leave if you want. I'm just surprised to see you at my door. Come on, I'll show you the room, Jim suggested. You are always welcome here. You look quite grown up. I told you I finally filled in the right spots, Emily laughed, turning around so Jim could admire her from all angles.
I wear the same bra size as my mother, although now it probably fits me better. Mom is getting pretty thin. I hitched a ride with the Sheards. They're going to Orlando, but they were kind enough to drop me off here, Emily said. I guess I knew that you would let me stay. It's spring break and I'll only be here for four days before they take me back into the snow and cold. This place is really good. I bet you like living here. It's not as big as our house, but it has everything I need, including a heated pool right outside the door. Jim agreed, watching Emily look around the apartment. Wow, looks like you're getting everything you need. Emily laughed when she found a bowl of condoms in his bedroom. Well done, Dad. You deserve a little fun after everything that's happened. I will not bother you. I'll just sit by the pool and soak up the sun while you're at work. What is that orange ball in the sky? I seem to remember seeing him at some point like the 4th of July two years ago. Tomorrow evening, when I return from work, we will go to dinner. There are a lot of great places to eat here, especially if you like beer and ribs or steak or seafood, Jim continued. I'll take you to one of the places where the guys from work hang out so they can see how beautiful my daughter is. The next evening, Jim and Emily sat at the rib joint and had a good time. Why did you forgive me, Dad? I don't know if I would do this if I were you. It was terrible of me to help your mom cheat on you. I hate myself for doing this, and I am truly sorry. I'll give a short answer, Jim replied. I'm much happier with you than when you weren't there. In this regard, I am selfish. It makes me happier and is now one of my life goals. I'm very glad that you think so. I hope you'll always be glad that I'm around, Emily said sincerely. We were always close, and I hated myself when I realized that I drove you away. Is there a chance that you will ever forgive your mother? She's not doing well without you. She has lost weight and hardly goes anywhere. When rumors started that Frank had a sexually transmitted disease and his sexual partners needed testing, half the people who worked at the store were scared to death. It appears that Frank contracted a sexually transmitted disease from the new cashier who was recently hired. They infected quite a lot of people. Mom was the only manager on this list, and it was very awkward for her, Emily recalled. Several times she came home in tears. To her credit, she stuck it out and finally came to terms with the fact that she really screwed up when she cheated on you. Emily, your mother and I agreed. We were partners. Partners must be honest with each other. They must trust each other. I don't trust her anymore, Jim admitted. I thought so, especially after I met your harem at the pool today. It was awkward having so many women asking me about you. From the way they talked about you, I could tell that at least four of them were sleeping with you. My father is a condominium owner, Emily grinned. Seriously, they all think you're a sensitive, honest, good-looking guy who's pretty good in bed. I don't know about all this. I have a couple of friends who drop by from time to time. I don't think they think I'm anything special. It's more like I'm free, Jim suggested modestly. Mom really screwed up, Emily said. Can I come as soon as I finish school and find a job here for the summer? I'm thinking about going to college here. If it's nearby, can I live with you? If it's not close enough to commute to work, can I spend weekends and holidays with you? My mom and I don't get along very well. We're just not close anymore. Her deception bothered me far more than I realized at the time. Jim readily agreed to Emily's request. He was much happier when he spent time with his only child. She was growing into a woman, and it gave him great pleasure to watch her grow up. He talked to her several times a week when she returned from spring break. She insisted that he not come to her graduation, but promised that he would go to Florida the next day. On Sunday afternoon, Jim opened the door to greet Emily when he came face to face with Helen. He couldn't think or move for what seemed like minutes, but he knew it could only be 10 or 15 seconds. He managed to come to his senses a little. Come in, Helen. Can I offer you a drink? Jim asked automatically, trying to understand why she was at his door. Thank you, Jim. That would be great, Helen replied, following Jim into the kitchen. He poured them both some iced tea and sat down as Helen sat down on the other side of the table. I was going to pick up Emily. She told me that she will live here with you. I moved my job to Dayton. We need to decide what we are going to do with the house. You've never filed for divorce and we haven't spoken, 
So I don't know what you'd like to do, Helen concluded. Why are you moving here? Jim was surprised. What do you think will happen? I think I'll stop freezing every winter, Helen joked. Emily goes to college here in Florida, so I have nothing to do there except be fodder for gossip. I don't know what Emily told you, but your parents don't talk to me, and my parents aren't much better. I've disappointed a lot of people, including myself, but mostly you. I can't ask you for forgiveness because my actions were unforgivable, Helen admitted. I'm looking for a new start where people won't joke about me having a pop and stuff like that. By the way, I was very glad that I didn't pass this on to you. I think you had stopped having sex with me by the time Frank showered me with that gift. I am responsible for what happened to us. I tried to blame you, then Frank, the girl who gave him the disease, even the guy who made the ladder. Frank fell down. I finally realized that it was all on me. I ruined my life and tried to ruin yours too. If you hadn't found out, you would have enjoyed Frank's little gift with me. I regret what I did. I wonder how I thought it seemed normal at the time, like I was entitled to a little fling. I even dragged Emily into this, and I'll never forgive myself for that. I almost ruined her relationship with her father because I was a selfish bitch. She warned me over and over that Frank was an ass and that this would end badly, but I didn't listen, Helen admitted. I'm so glad you let her back into your life. Your love and approval means a lot to her. This meant a lot to me before I lost my way. Now that I don't have it, I would give anything to have it back. I think we need to make a list of things to sell and split the money. I thought you already filed for divorce. Isn't Frank single now? Jim asked pointedly. I heard that's true, but I don't give a damn about that bastard if that's what you mean. I'm a stupid bitch, but not enough to divorce you for Frank. Helen replied. I thought you had already divorced me. I've given you many reasons. I think I'm happy with what I'm doing here, Jim replied. You know how much I hate change, and divorce can change a lot. We should discuss this now, shouldn't we? I suppose so, if you want. I would like to stay married, although my past actions disprove this statement. I know that you are too good a man to stay with a wife who lies and cheats. I always knew it but I told myself you'll never know. Where will you stay today? Asked Jim. We have some time. We can discuss the sale of the house and everything else we have tied up within the next week or two. I'm going to look for a motel when I leave here. I saw something close to Highway 95. They're pretty close to Home Depot. I start working there in a week, Helen said. Emily went grocery shopping so we could have time to talk, but she'll be back soon and I have to go. Emily's room has two single beds. You can stay there if she doesn't mind, Jim suggested. Won't this make you uncomfortable? I know that I'm not your favorite person right now, Helen said reservedly. I'll be fine if Emily doesn't mind. We'll ask her when she comes, Jim replied. Of course, Emily didn't mind her mother sharing a room with her for a while. Over the next few days, the three began to fall back into the habits they had shared for years. Jim avoided the pool and the other ladies while Helen was under his roof. He had no desire to hurt her. There are several women who come to the pool and want to know when I'm leaving, Helen began one evening after Emily had left for a concert. They always talk about your big bowl of condoms and which ones they prefer. It's pretty funny if you think about it. They did everything except tell me I ruined their sex life. Have you made four women happy, Jim? I'm impressed. It's a pity that I didn't make an impression on you before meeting Frank, Jim snapped. I won't apologize for pleasing these ladies. None of them are married and they know that I don't make any commitments. I try to give them as much pleasure as I get and they love it. How about you have some fun with me? Helen asked. There are no conditions in my offer. I just feel like I owe you a lot for treating me so well after what I did to you. I'm not the same guy you remember. Jim insisted. I'm more demanding and assertive. I tell these women what I want, and they seem to enjoy doing it. I never let them stay more than one night at a time. So be with me for one night. I can handle anything you offer me. I will feel better for what I did, and will do everything to make you feel much better, Helen promised. Jim thought about her words for a few minutes and made a decision. 
Ten minutes later, they were lying naked on his bed. My God! Helen exhaled, trying to catch her breath. That was incredible. You've learned a few new tricks. Thank you, Jim. Helen was carrying her clothes from Jim's room to Emily's room when she heard Emily's voice. Guys, you've made enough noise. I'm glad you're done so I can get some sleep. Helen stayed with Emily and Jim for the summer. She slept on the second bed in Emily's room, but often visited Jim. She often told Jim that he was the only man she would ever have. Jim simply nodded in agreement. After the first night, Jim noticed that Helen was regularly counting the condoms in the bowl. He realized that she was trying to give everything she had so that he could not service the other ladies in the building. Helen didn't like the fact that her shift ended at 10 in the evening, and Jim came home at 5. At least twice a week she would come home to find fresh sheets on his bed and a couple of condoms lighter. Since she had to be at work at 2 o'clock, she often spent the morning by the pool. For the most part, the other ladies weren't unkind to her. It was obvious that they all knew that her marriage was almost in its death throes, and that she was the one who created the damage by cheating. Every now and then, one of the ladies would make a remark or ask a question that Helen knew would be her cue. Helen, have you chosen new blue bed linen for Jim's room? asked Susan Struthers one morning. It goes well with curtains and carpet. Yes, of course, agreed Monica Barron. It's a beautiful masculine color, and Jim is a very masculine guy. Jim, you don't need these women in your bed, Helen whined that night. I'll give you as much sex as you want. I'm enough for you, isn't it? Exactly. Jim replied. I will never have anything to do with any of these women again. Then why are there two fewer condoms in the bowl today? How does everyone know what color your bedding is? Helen asked. I have no idea, Jim answered with a smile. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.